Good morning, South Point Church. Man, that video like fires me up. It's almost like I picked it out or something because I did. (laughs) So I'm Tracy. I'm part of the staff team here. Um, And I'm going to talk with you about something that um, I'm really excited about today that I'm passionate about. Uh, Before we jump in, let me ask you a question. Let's talk about kids for a second. How many of you have kids? Okay, so like a lot. Okay, how many of you know a kid? And great. And here's a really tough one. How many of you have been a kid? Probably like most of us. Okay. So most of us in the room and online have some familiarity with kids. So great. So it turns out that children uh, are widely influenced by the behaviors and actions and habits of the adults around them, right? It's like science or something. And so, um, I have to be aware, you know, around my children that my behavior is going to greatly influence the adults that they grow into unless they do a lot of therapy and work through it. And so uh, I wish they would only grab onto my positive behaviors. It turns out, unfortunately, they see them all um, positive or negative. And so um, sometimes... I like have to draw attention to, or to myself, bring attention to like, oh, are there some things that I should be doing differently than the way that I'm currently doing them? Um, For example, I have a tendency to just be a loud person. Like the way that I operate in the world is just kind of at a loud volume. I don't really know why, it's just the way that it is. Thank you for loving me anyway. Um, And a few years ago, I remember there was a day where my family, we were at home. My kids were being kids and playing and being kind of loud. The TV was on. So there's like a lot of commotion happening. And I was in the next room and I needed to say something to my kids. I don't remember what it was, but I like said it and got no response. It was like, okay, obviously they didn't hear me. So I said it louder, still no response because there's the TV and they're playing and stuff. And so I'm noticing that the situation is escalating, the volume is raising, and I'm getting irritated because they are not getting my message. And finally I go, everybody be quiet! And in that moment I went, huh, like I don't know if shouting the words be quiet, like really get the message across that I am trying to convey to them. Like somehow there's like a disconnect between the words and the action here. And I went like, oh my gosh, like I'm the problem. It's me. Like Taylor Swift wrote a song about me. And so sometimes I think we realize that our actions maybe aren't exactly getting us the results that we want, aren't like exactly aligned with what we're hoping to do. Um, And so how do we fix that? How do we go like, okay, there's something I wanna change. How do I change that? Well, good news. We're at church, and if you've ever spent any time at church or like in a Sunday school class, you know the answer to absolutely every question that is asked is Jesus, Jesus! gold stars all around. Okay, great. And so I say that jokingly, but it actually really is true. Um, And so the answer to the question, how do we fix this, is Jesus. (laughs) Because Jesus changes everything, everything. And so last week we talked about how Jesus can change your marriage. Next week, our next gen pastor, Jen Curtis, is going to be talking about how Jesus can change your parenting. And today, your finances get fired up, you guys. I know that money is a conversation everybody loves to have, especially at church. Like, I know you're as fired up as I am about this. Um, And so... (laughs) I do want to say um, that I know this is an uncomfortable thing to talk about at church, but we're gonna go to uncomfortable places because we want you to experience the goodness of God in all areas of your life, including your finances. Now, I wanna be clear, this is not a recipe for if you follow Jesus, then you get a car, you get a car, you get a car. It is not that, absolutely not. Like, I've read this book cover to cover quite a few times, and nowhere in here does it say, if you follow Jesus, you will be rich, you will be wealthy, you will be prosperous. Um, It actually kind of says the opposite. It kind of says, Jesus says, we're not to store up our treasures here on earth. So we're going to dig into that a little bit today. Jesus wants us to follow him, and he wants our hearts. 
He wants to invite us into the freedom that is available when we trust in him in every area of our lives, including our finances. At South Point, one of our core values is that we are contributors, not consumers. And that's true in many ways. Today, we're going to look at that through the lens of our finances. Um, So let's get into it. Jesus changes our finances. I truly believe that today's discussion is a step in drawing closer to God and the depth of relationship that he wants with you. Jesus is constantly inviting us into something better than what we even knew was available. Um, And I know talking about money at church can be a touchy subject. Like historically, it's not a topic that the church has always handled beautifully. Um, And so if you personally have experienced church hurt surrounding how money is managed, um, I want to apologize. Um, And at South Point, I will tell you, like, we aren't perfect. We don't get everything right. Um, But what we do is we go to this book and we go, okay, what does this say we're supposed to do? And we're going to do that. Um, And so that's what we're going to dig into today. I also want to tell you that I am not a, like, financial advisor or, like, debt relief person. Like, this is not how I, a message about how I think you should manage your money. Like, not at all. This is, we're going to go to the Bible and see what it says, and then we're going to try to do that. Um, And I I think, I don't know about you, but, like, um, I've experienced kind of uh, discomfort and fear in churches when they talk about money because it feels like they're going, give me your money, (laughs) give me your money. But here's the thing, you guys. God doesn't need your money. He's doing just fine. He's good. He's got a 401k. He is all set to go like he is in good shape. So we're not here because God desperately needs your money because that is not the case. We are talking about this today because in the Bible, Jesus goes directly to the heart of what people are dealing with. He goes to uncomfortable and unpopular places because he wants good for your life and for your life to be changed. And he fights on behalf of God's people. He knows that money can sometimes be a stronghold on our hearts and minds. And Jesus is a way maker and a chain breaker. And he wants to help us break those strongholds. I know that for the folks that are in here and the folks that are watching online, there are a wide variety of life experiences regarding uh, like how finances were approached in your life. I, I totally get that. And I know that the experiences that we've had greatly impact uh, our thinking and our actions surrounding money now. Um, but I, I want to like take a moment and go, hey, like this is not about fear. This is not about shame. This is not about guilt. Absolutely not. So if you're like feeling yourself like tighten up and your shoulders are in your ears and your jaws clenching and you're feeling sick to your stomach, I would invite you to take a deep breath and to relax a little bit and to go, I am not asking a single thing from you today. I want to encourage you to be willing to challenge your thinking and to consider the freedom that is offered through following Jesus. Um, Maybe today, like you are here and like right now in your life, you are experiencing crushing debt and you don't know how to get out. Maybe you are here and you are experiencing homelessness right now. Or maybe you're experiencing food insecurity. If any of that is true of you, I want you to hear two things. I'm not asking anything from you that you don't have. And if that is, is your situation currently and you have not currently um, connected with the cause and care team at South Point, please find me or Pastor Kyle after the service because nobody is meant to walk through life alone, okay? Um, so what does the Bible say about money? It turns out like a lot. So uh, if you count up the verses in the Bible about prayer, for example, there are about 500. But if you count up the verses in the Bible about money, there are 2,000. So it turns out like maybe it's something we should think about. Maybe it's something we should pay attention to um, and talk about. Like what does the Bible say about this? 
And so uh, we're going to jump into Matthew 6. Uh, and Jesus is going to be talking. Now, Matthew 6. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. And the New Testament is like Jesus and onward after that. Um, and so we're going to read from chapter 6. So like, this is like right out the gate, like the, the sixth chapter of the New Testament. So we're right at the start here. Uh, and Jesus already, like immediately, is talking to us about how we should handle money. So he says in verse 19... Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So Jesus is coming in hot saying, hey, if we store up our treasure on earth, that's where our hearts will be. And if you're a Christ follower, our hearts shouldn't be on the things of this earth because this is not our home. We're only here for a little while. The treasure that we should be storing up is in heaven. He continues on in verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Okay, so like immediately Jesus is telling us, hey, we are not gonna put our hope or our love or our trust or our faith in money because it can be destroyed and it's only temporary. Like, okay, all right, so got it. Okay, great. I'm not gonna love money, but like um, how do I avoid that? and manage money well. Okay, so like, how do we do that? Um, so in order to be good stewards of our resources, and the word steward just means like you're responsible for supplies. Um, so in order to be a good steward or a good manager of the resources that are available to me, first I've got to understand who is the owner of those resources. Like where did they come from? Who do they belong to? because it's not me. And so um, in Philippians 4, uh, 19, it says, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. That God will meet all our needs. And then in Matthew 25, Jesus is telling a story about a wealthy master who represents God and his servants who represent us. And in this story, uh, the wealthy master distributes his wealth among his servants. And when his servants were good stewards with the wealth and they worked and they labored and they used those resources responsibly, the scripture says in Matthew 25, verse 23, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. So God holds the ownership of all resources and he allows us to be the managers of those resources while we're here. He puts them into our care, but they don't actually belong to us. Um, and when we understand that God is a generous owner and he distributes his wealth among his people, um, that can help us understand that when we are being responsible with finances, we're just caring for what already belongs to God. Because it's not ours anyway. We are stewarding and managing what already belongs to him. And so one way that Jesus changes our finances is by teaching us to recognize God as the owner, not us. When we understand that God is the owner and we are just like the managers, we're just taking care of it, um, it can help us shift our perspective a little bit on how we think about money. It, it can help us um, have some heart change surrounding our finances. He said, I have trusted you with a few things because he is a generous owner and we can be faithful stewards. And that's why at South Point, we're contributors and not consumers. And when we say that, 
that we're contributors, not consumers. We're not just saying like in regards to like your time at church and your giving at church. We're saying in, in all areas of your life, in all areas of your finances, we are contributors and not consumers. Every single thing that we have has been given to us by our Father. Like literally every single thing. And it's been given to us so that we can manage it responsibly, so that we can take care of our needs and the needs of our family. Needs, needs, different than once. Um, and also so that we can share with others. God has given so that we might also give. Uh, if you have done Rooted in the last year or two, and if you haven't, like I highly encourage you to, but if you've had, you've probably heard me share this story. So uh, in 2015, my son was born, my youngest was born, and like the day he was born, we were in the hospital. My parents had uh, my daughter Kylie, who had just turned two, and they brought her to meet her baby brother at the hospital, right? And so she comes into the room, and I'm like in the hospital bed holding Andy, and Kylie comes in, and she's holding a snack. She had some crackers in her hand, and she climbs up onto the bed and like gets in my lap and like looks over at her brother and I am emotionally prepared for like a beautiful hallmark moment where these siblings look into each other's eyes even though like newborns can't really see but like who cares they look into each other's eyes and they just fall in love with each other and it starts a lifelong bond of just love and compassion so that was my expectation so Kylie gets up on the bed and is in my arms and looks at her brother, looks him in the eyes and says, these are mine, you can't have my crackers. <laughs> okay. And it's been very similar to that ever since. Uh, and so I think every kid knows the word mine. Like it's like built into their DNA. It's woven into who they are. Um, and I'm like, dude, nobody wants your crackers. But we do want you to understand that they were given to you, and you can open up your hand a little bit. Um, but here's the trouble. If we don't learn when we're really young to open up our hands, then we become teenagers who say mine, and young adults who say mine, and then full-fledged adults who say mine. And sometimes that sounds like, I earned this. Or sometimes it sounds like, I deserve this. And I want us to be willing to challenge this way of thinking because the way that we think about and use money can be another way we draw closer to God. Another way that Jesus changes our finances is he teaches us to manage his resources well. His resources. God wants your heart and he wants what's best for you. He doesn't need your crackers. He wants us to draw closer to him. And so we are contributors and not consumers. Uh, in Luke 16, a little later in the New Testament, Jesus is talking again and he says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And those true riches are referring to treasures in heaven. We want to manage the resources well that have been put in our care and manage them in a responsible way. But we're not meant to store up riches and wealth and things here on earth because those things are temporary and can be destroyed. And then another thing, another way Jesus changes our finances is by teaching us to give generously. Give generously. I need to give not because God can't do it without me, but because uh, of the hold that money can have on my soul. Giving further develops a depth of relationship with the Father that I am neglecting without it. Giving further develops a depth of relationship with the Father that I am neglecting without it. 
The same way at church, we worship, like we were singing songs, so we worship with musical worship, and we worship by praying, and we worship by reading scripture, and we worship by gathering together. Being generous is also an act of worship. Uh, In Mark 12, Jesus and the disciples were hanging out. The disciples are like his friends and followers. And they go to church. They go to a temple. And they're sitting in there. And then in uh, Mark 12, 41, this is what happens. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put. Offerings are like giving, like financial giving. And he watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she has to live on. And like, look at the impact of her giving. Jesus says she has put in more than all the others. And like today, more than 2,000 years later, we are still reading about her and talking about her because of her generosity. Um, You've probably heard uh, the word tithe, like in um, response to like giving at church. Tithes and offerings is like a phrase that you might hear. And the word tithe actually means a tenth meaning 10%. Before anyone has a heart attack, let me say, we are not asking you to give what you do not have. Let me say that one more time. I'm not asking you to give what you do not have. Also, if you are not a follower of Christ, you have absolutely no responsibility here. You can just relax. (laughs) If you are a follower of Christ, and you call a church your home, whether it's South Point or another one of the wonderful churches in our local community or around the world, I would ask you to consider your responsibility and what God is asking you to do to partner with what he's doing in his church. I wanna encourage you to consider starting small and consistent. I'm not suggesting that if you have never partnered with the church and what God's doing through the church, I'm not suggesting that like today you go write a check for 10% of your income. That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking you to make a spiritual commitment to starting small and consistent. And then watch God's faithfulness. Um, And when I say start small, like it sounds crazy because of our like worldly view of money, but it's not about the number. Like just as Jesus said, the widow gave more than everyone else. It's not about the number. It's about the condition of your heart when you give. This is an opportunity to grow closer to God in trust. And then after we start small, I'm not saying, okay, start small and then go check, did it. I'm all set. Um, I would... I would challenge you to have a growth mindset and to consider how you can be generous with the resources that God has put in your care for the time that you are here. Um, And what's really interesting, there's only one time in this entire book that God says to test him, only once. And it's in regard to our generosity, to trusting him with our finances. In Malachi 3.10, It says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I don't know, you guys. It seems like he's probably good for it. Like, if he's like, hey, test me in this, like, come at me, bro. Like, let's see what happens. So it seems like Um, We could probably trust him. But I I do encourage you to start small and then have a growth mindset once you see the faithfulness of God. So how does Jesus change our finances? He teaches us to recognize God as the owner of absolutely everything. He teaches us to manage his resources well. His, not ours. 
and he teaches us to give generously. If you are here today and you are one of the folks that like has a sick stomach right now and feels so overwhelmed and you don't even know where you could possibly begin, um, I wanna encourage you. We have a small group, a financial small group called I Was Broke, Now I'm Not. That's the name of it. I Was Broke, Now I'm Not. And um, it's gonna start, like we do, we offer it a couple of times of a year. It's gonna start again in the fall. So like in August, we're gonna start advertising and telling you when small groups are starting back up. If you are someone who is experiencing debt or you don't see a way that you could get from where you are now to um, a generous heart, I encourage you to consider making it a priority to join this small group. And during that small group, you will like dig into the nitty gritty of your finances, your expenses, your budget, and look at um, biblically what does scripture say and how can you impact like what is yours to manage in a way that can get you to the freedom that is offered in Jesus. So I ask you to make that a priority and make time for that. Now, everyone, regardless of where you are currently with your finances and with your giving and your generosity, I would ask absolutely everyone in this room and online to consider this week, take, this is my challenge, consider this week, how are you currently consuming where you should be contributing? How can you be a contributor and not a consumer this week? And it's gonna look different for everybody but how can you be a contributor and not a consumer? I also challenge you to consider shifting your view and allow Jesus to change your finances and step into the freedom that only he can offer. We are contributors, not consumers, and Jesus changes absolutely everything. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are provider. One of your names is Jaira. The Lord provides, God. We thank you that you are a generous owner and that you distribute your wealth among your people. God, would you teach us, would you move in our hearts and teach us to be responsible and manage well the resources that you have put in our care, God. Teach us to put our eyes always on you and to put our hope and our love and our trust and our faith in you alone, God. God, move in our hearts. Show us how we can be generous and show us how we can be contributors, God. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, so that he could change everything, God. Everything. We love you. We trust you. Thank you for weaving together this church community, this church family, so that no one walks through life alone, God. We love you, Father. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen.